I'm not as familiar as I'd like to be with what was being done in New England before the big revival. Um, there, there are a few books like Tolman and Page and, and a few references. Um, the early years of Northern Junket, for instance, um, uh, Ralph always printed a contra dance and a square dance in each issue of Northern Junket. So you can look at the squares and, and see that there was quite a variety of stuff being done. But by the time he started putting out that magazine, it was 1949, and we were into the revival. And a lot of the, the squares that he printed didn't necessarily come from New England. So my, my take on it is that up until the late 40s, uh, the squares that were done in New England were mostly uh, either uh, fairly simple quadrille figures like uh, heads right and left over and back, head ladies chain over and back, that sort of thing, uh, or fairly easy visiting couple dances of the type that were done all over the Northeast, first couple out to the right, circle left, maybe circle right, oh, swing. And you balance with those two, swing, and you join, swing, hand, yeah, circle, once exactly. around. Exactly. Swing your opposite, swing your own, and on to the next. Uh, and there, there were places, especially outside New England, but I think also in New England, where that was the only kind of square they knew. Um, sometimes uh, modern callers pejoratively would, would refer to the Eastern style of dancing as swap and swing, because that was uh, in, in, in places where the dancing had, some, say, some would say, de degenerated, uh, where they only knew one kind of square, it would be first couple out to the right, circle, swing your opposite, swing your own, on to the next, and they would do that same dance all night to various pieces of music. They might do it to Red River Valley, they might do it to Coming Round the Mountain, uh, you know, four or five or six different tunes during the night, uh, and as a, probably as a singing call, uh, and it would be the same dance each time. Sort of the way that uh, Al Brundage describes going to Maine uh, as a college student and uh, finding dances where they did Lady of the Lake all night. They would do Lady of the Lake, three ballroom dances, Lady of the Lake, three ballroom dances all, all evening. And so there were places where they did basically the one square dance. There might be minor variations. There might be uh, the, the, something like Listen to the Mockingbird, first couple promenade the outside, go into the middle, swing your partner in the center, six hands around, and kiss her if you dare. But um, I would say most places probably the, the, the square figures that were used were pretty simple. Uh, this was a period when uh, not many communities were, were doing much with squares that was visible to the outside world. We, we really don't have a way of knowing uh, how many towns danced and how many didn't, or where they didn't dance at all, or where the uh, things like the Foxtrot had taken over entirely, and where they still did squares and or contras. Um, but the impression I get is that uh, Contras were a dying breed, that, that Ralph and a, a handful of other callers were doing them. But in general, uh, either country dancing had died out completely by the 1940s, or they were doing mostly or all squares, and fairly simple squares at that. I think it was the, the recreational square dance revival that really spurred the uh, what we think of now as modern New England style, the sort of thing that Ted Sinella promoted and, and composed himself. Uh, in the Boston area around 1950, there were probably a dozen callers, at least half a dozen, who were very active, uh, who were calling all the old traditional squares and trying their hand at writing their own. Huh. And, and just as in the Western square dance movement, the, the tendency was to find ways to get more people active more of the time. Uh, at that point, square dancing all over the country stopped being something that people in a community did on a Saturday night because that was their social gathering and started being something people did as a hobby or as part of education. They, they, they might do it in, in elementary school or high school or college. In college they might learn to teach it if they were going into education and people would intentionally gather, they would form clubs and in the traditional side. They didn't always call them clubs, but they served the same function. There would be a dance series that might be run by an, a college outing club or uh, by a, a dance society. But uh, the important thing is that 
This was not, as, as Mary Dart said in her dissertation, these were not community dances. These were dance communities where people got together for the express purpose of dancing. And I think when that started was right around the late 40s, early 50s. And I think that's when the, the choreography started to change because people were, were dancing as a hobby. Uh, they enjoyed the old dances, but they didn't want to necessarily want to do the same dance uh, every week or, or every two weeks, let alone several times a night. And uh, the, the callers were feeling creative and trying their hand at saying, okay, you know, how can we, how can we preserve the fun of this sort of thing, but uh, get more people moving more of the time? Or just maybe somebody had thought up a new twist, a, a, a new, you know, just, just out of curiosity or ex taking it as a challenge to figure out how many different ways can you manipulate people in a four couple square formation. Here are the things that we know have been tried already. Let's see if, if we can come up with something that hasn't been tried before. Mm -hmm. and, and they found that it was possible. Uh, in, in New England, it wasn't so much coming up with, with new figures that had names. It was mostly, I mean, new dance movements that had names like inventing a new thing along with Ladies Jane and Right and Left. Um, it would be more combining the existing ones in new ways. And if there was a call that, that wasn't a standard call like right and left through, uh, it would be something you could call in plain English, like the first couple separate, go around three people, stand next to your corner, that sort of thing. Uh, the, uh, the idea was to keep it accessible, to, to, to keep it, uh, especially as the Western square dance movement uh, started to morph into uh, the kind of choreography that required people to take lessons. I think a lot of callers in New England were determined that they were going to keep this whole thing accessible, that you, even if they offered uh, six or eight weeks of, of lessons, as I think Ralph Page did in Boston, um, most dances you could come in just completely off the street and get pulled through. Uh, it wasn't like you had to take a whole semester of lessons. And with that in mind, um, I think the callers deliberately kept the stuff fairly simple in terms of the number of calls and the way they were combined so that the figures would be different from the old ones, but they would, somebody who knew the old ones wouldn't have much trouble learning the newer ones. And I, I don't think it was until the 19, late 60s or 70s that, that even Ted Sinella uh, was writing things that, that took some practice that, that would be more suitable for what he called intermediate or advanced dancers. I, th I think from, from the 40s right up through the mid 60s, uh, most of the dancing was, the, the choreography was fairly elementary yeah. in, in nature. I hadn't thought of it this way, that at the same time, the post-World War II in New England, we have these callers who had been raised on a fairly traditional diet who started creating new dances at the same time as modern western was coming along yeah. creating oh yeah and, and and they were very aware of what was happening in the west um, right from the start i mean these were literate people these were people who uh, who wanted to know what was the, the the newest thing whether whether or not they chose to to use it they wanted to know what was going on in the rest of the dance world, so they would certainly be subscribing to the magazines like Sets in Order um, and, and buying the books of, of Western, of Texas and various Midwestern and Western area figures. And I think the, the New England callers, uh, the ones who didn't go modern Western, uh, they, they said to themselves and to each other, um, you know, we're, we're not against change, but we want to think about what we adopt and, and what we change, what we throw out and what we keep. And, and I, I think there was, even though there was no, um, there was no uh, overall umbrella official group of traditional callers, uh, I think there was a, a kind of collective decision, maybe even subconscious, uh, to avoid the excesses that were that they saw happening in the West, um, particularly uh, making the dance inaccessible.
by by requiring people to take lessons. Huh. You know, they they weren't against change, but they 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 were against um, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. The change of that magnitude requiring yeah. lessons was a change that they were not prepared to. Yeah, I mean, they, they some of them experimented um, with some of the new calls that were coming from other parts of the country. Uh, we heard Jim Mayo talk about the one time that Ralph Page called an Alaman Thar, and and they were through the years. You know, I've I've seen New England callers who were traditionalists introduce uh, figures from outside New England just for the fun of it, but typically they wouldn't expect the dancers to remember that figure the next time they got together. It would be sort of a workshop within an evening just for fun, and the, the, the number of figures or the number of dance movements that, that a traditional dancer was expected to remember stayed pretty much the same for 30 or 40 years. We're, we're now seeing in the Contra world uh, where uh, there are several moves borrowed from English country dancing and from modern square dancing that have become pretty standard, which means that somebody learning contra dancing needs to know about 50% more terms than they did 20 years ago, which makes me think, you know, do we really know what we're getting into here? Um, but. Um, I suppose change is inevitable that, that, that you know, each generation... Has to make the same mistakes. Well, and, and that uh, you know, change, things change to suit the tastes of the next generation. What the kids are doing now doesn't look quite like what we did 30 years ago, but what we did didn't look quite like what Ralph Page was doing in 1940. Exactly.